So, yeah, getting this thing started, how would you describe what exactly it is that you do or maybe what it is that you talk about on your channel? It's uh, it's not an easy thing to kind of describe, but, you know, th this gets right to the heart of the of the subject, right, which is kind of definitions, labels, you know, how the mind loves to kind of categorize what is and, and try and decipher it and, and put things in boxes. So um, I will do that, obviously, because otherwise the mind can't really grasp at things, but it's all kind of meaningless. We'll, we'll probably get into, get into that at yep. some point. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess ultimately, pulled to share my, the, my truth or what I've experienced, what I know at my deepest level to try and help so-called others with, with their experience. Because I know, you know, in my sort of spiritual journey, if we want to call it that, there are times when you feel you're completely alone, you feel like you're losing your mind, your friends and family maybe don't understand or you don't even want to talk to them about it. You'll encounter, you know, teachers or gurus or whatever online or maybe in person. And sometimes they can seem quite distant. Uh, you know, they'll they'll say things and you you kind of in, you get it intellectually, but somehow it feels different to what you're going through. So I, I'm just trying to, you know, as I say, feel pulled to share it what I've experienced and what I know it and maybe it will help mm -hmm. in some That's way. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's awesome that we live in this time and we can do this. And, uh, if we are pulled to share, we share. And if we're pulled to find guidance, it's at our fingertips, it's in our pockets. So yeah, I don't know. It's uh wonderful to be able to have this and have people like you spreading the good word for the best of our ability, you know? Um, yeah. So uh, let's see. Where does this all come from for you? Is there a, is there a moment of awakening that we can get into or moments maybe uh, of some sort of epiphany and what all of this is? You know, what exactly did you describe kind of why you do it, you know, to create a community of the sort? Um, but where does this come from? for you you know like how do you get on this wavelength i guess yeah i mean ultimately it's kind of it's truth or whatever we want to call this unnameable thing that everybody dances around right we call it spirit or consciousness or awareness or god or, or whatever it's really that waking up to itself opening up to itself and and being called to share with itself, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. um, you know, I can look back on, you know, the, the so-called character here and, and the story. Um, and from the outside looking in, someone may say, oh, well, that led to that and that led to that and so on. The, the danger with that is that there isn't any cause and effect. There's not, you know, there isn't a doer. There's nothing, there's nothing separate here in this thing than anything else you know what i mean like the the classic example i say is well try spending this weekend outside of the universe you know let, let me know how that goes like i mean yeah. you, you're not an observable this you're not moving in this you're not part of it you are it um in in terms of kind of an epiphany i mean it's just never ending it's you know it's never like the universe epiphany. when it it's just constant it's you know they always feel final so whenever there's some sort of breakthrough you're like oh yeah. i got wow, it. that yeah exactly <laughs> um yeah but yeah they're just it, it's just never ending but i mean it, it was things you know i was taught how to meditate when i was a kid at school it's probably the start of it um and I got to a certain level in the sort of material world with business and in, in sport and stuff like that um, and kind of reached the top of some of the mountains that, that many people in, in the sort of materialist construct believe should 
lead to, you know, happiness and all that. And I'm like, hmm, well, that's weird because there's actually nothing here. Uh, you know, there's no difference to to before. So it was really a kind of a an eye-opening thing of, well, if not this, then then what? So there was kind of these two seeming trajectories, one sort of on the spiritual side and one on the physical material side, both trying to get to the same place, which is which is happiness. Mm -hmm. The joke, of course, being that it, that is literally what you are. It's not something that you get or something that you move to. It is that is the nature of you yeah. ultimately. Mm -hmm. Um like the you know you take something simple like a desire um let's say a desire even just something simple like chocolate so the mind has this sense of lack all the time right it's never good enough for the mind the mind's like ah i want more of it or i don't feel quite right so i need something so let's just say it's something simple like chocolate so that desire starts the moment the mind takes hold of that it kind of um magnifies it magnifies the intent now it's like now the mind's like saying, oh my god like i must have this right mm -hmm. and then when you have it there's a moment it can be seconds or minutes where you feel sated like you feel satisfied and i used to equate that with oh yeah that's the thing right it's because of the thing that i got a thing but it's very easy to to see through that illusion because it doesn't take long for that to wane and you're like i need someone else well, yep. and the other thing is you've eaten chocolate before and it didn't you why are you wanting it again if if that was the the thing right mm -hmm. so it's actually the it's the cessation it's the stopping of the desire that creates that sensation of happiness when you actually lack and, and not reaching. Um, so if you imagine like a, an elastic band, rubber band, um, you know, the moment you go external, you're, you're creating stress on this thing. Yeah. You're trying to get something you don't have, or you're trying to become something you're not, or you're trying to get information that you feel you need you stressing out this band like another way i've heard this is you know you it's like you're on a speedboat zooming around a lake saying where's the calm water like this is well, there's no calmness anywhere like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? it's and that's easy it, the, all these things are easy to concept uh, to intellectualize and, and grasp at the mind level but over time is is these kind of breakthroughs seem to occur they there's like a flip-flopping right so like you've it sounds like you recognize as well you have these things like oh my god that's it <laughs> why did i see this before it's so obvious yeah and then you go back to before you like flip-flop back and forth but eventually they it just kind of settles so yeah as i say for, for me there were things like you know learning to meditate um i had an out of body experience when i was uh, sick one time where um i was asleep in bed i woke up i felt really groggy so i sat on the side of the bed i walked around my room and i did non-dream type stuff because i wanted to verify there wasn't a dream because it felt a little bit dreamlike so i was studying the posters on my wall i was looking um I had keys in the door, so I'd jangle the keys in the door just to see if they were physically real and made the sound, and they did. Mm. And then I thought, I'll look at my watch and see what time it is. And I had a black digital watch uh, back in the day. This is how long ago it was. Mm. Casio watch. And um, I looked at my watch, and it said zero, 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 zero. And it, the time wasn't moving. The seconds weren't moving. And then I turned around and looked at the bed, and I was asleep. In, in the bed and I walked up to myself and pushed and then I woke up. So it, it was like things like that seemed to 
start happening. And I say on those two trajectories of let's go out and dominate the world and, you know, make millions of dollars and get perfect relationships and health and fitness and, and everything else. And then you have these kind of things happening that are like, wait a minute, is this whole game is not actually what it's purported to be in the first place. I'm not even what I thought I was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is like, you know, it's, it's like playing, you know, it's like playing poker and some, it's not like somebody changes the rules. They literally say, Oh, you're not, you're not a poker player. You're actually the table. I mean, and, yeah. or, or something like that. It just, yeah. I mean, it doesn't change the game. It just obliterates the game. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the biggest thing that you mentioned about the dichotomy between the material and the spiritual um, is you said, we're all looking for happiness. The material is all temporary happiness. It's all just pleasure, you could say, that comes and goes. But this spiritual happiness, if you even want to call it happiness, is permanent. It's forever. It always was, it always is, and it always will be. And like you said, it is it is you. You are joy. You are happiness. You are Satya Ananda. And that is... Yeah, that transcends all the stuff of the game, you know, all the phenomena of life that transcends everything. Um, it doesn't negate it, but it definitely, once you see it, you can't unsee it, that's for sure. And it transcends, I don't know, there's just a feeling of, it's like almost stepping back from the game of poker, as you said, and just being able to see it all for what it is. Um, yeah, and that is uh, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest revelation that one could have stowed upon themselves in this experience, you know, to know that you are literally bliss itself. That's some powerful stuff, man, for sure. Um, yeah. How do you suppose that we all work our way toward this and are able to see this truth that is hidden in plain sight. Is there a general recommendation that you would give people? Like, would you say meditation uh, or something of the like to be able to see this? There's kind of three commonly accepted. Well, I, I guess there's four. There's, there's an outward path. There's an inward path. There's a direct path. And there's a just letting go right these are the four common things that people talk about in spirituality so the outward path is is devotion to something so devotion to a teacher a guru to to god bhakti and the art pardon me bhakti right yeah mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. so it's going out the way and the idea is that again to use this rubber band example it is not it's not to emphasize that you don't have what you're going out towards, although initially that is what, unfortunately what can happen. Because the moment that you say, I need to go get this, and of course, even seeking in spirituality, spirituality can be used as a sole form of desire and trying to get, you know, yeah. giving up money or giving up desires and saying, oh, I'm going to go and, you know, go to a thousand retreats this year and get enlightenment. It is the same thing. Yeah. The same kind of activity. But the outward activity is designed to stretch the rubber band so far that it just disintegrates to nothing so that you actually merge with whatever it is you're devoted to. So that's the outward path. The inward path is self-inquiry. So, you know, studying the nature of self. What am I? What was my face before I was born? The netty, netty approach. So I'm not this. I'm not the body. I'm not the mind. You know, what are you left with? So that's inward. And meditation, of course, would, would fall into that. Um, then you have the, um, yeah, like the letting go or, or the surrender, which is probably, it's the most confusing and I think the most frustrating sort of direction that spiritual teachers give, which is let go. Because the mind instantly says, well, how do I let go? And then the teacher will say, oh, well, you just let go of letting go. <laughs> yeah. And I, what like it, you can't you can't do anything that you know the good news is there's nothing you have to do but the bad news is there's nothing you can do 
Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, in, in times when I've had, you know, these big shifts, I've been not able to even operate properly in the sort of human sense, right? I've incapacitated really for months. But I'd kind of misunderstood this sort of letting go and this surrender and this doing nothing. And I was forcibly doing nothing. So the metaphor that I use is a river, right? So if you've got a river, is life. It's flowing all the time. Before any kind of spiritual pursuit, people are typically trying to swim up the river. They're trying to control yeah. where they go, get what they want. They're not happy with the nature of the river and they're going against it. Then they are woken up in some way to the, the spiritual path whether they're dissatisfied with life or they've tried getting things that didn't work or whatever it is that sparks that at the ultimate level, it's, you know, the truth itself is wanting to, to discover itself or playing hide and seek with itself or whatever. Um, but when that's, when that begins, there's, um, a sort of letting go of swimming upstream. And when you get that instruction, well, this is what I did anyway, when I got the instruction of, stop you know just give in i was like in the river like this like stood up i'm like oh i'm, I'm not doing anything i'm doing nothing here like you know <laughs> the water is trying to get past me now but i'm not going with the flow like true letting go is just actually letting go and just going downstream being part of the stream that that you already are um you know it's it's one of those questions. It's like, you know, what can, what does the wave have to do to, to become an ocean? I mean, it's an insane question, right? I mean, it just, but when the wave still thinks it's a wave, then seemingly there are things to do. And if you're called to meditate or chant or, you know, whatever, then, you know, listen to that because it's, it's, you know, it's itself telling itself this is what it needs to do to discover itself. Hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, the cherry blossom tree. You know, I see these trees in Japan with it beautiful sort of pink blossoms on them. They all, they all blossom eventually. Every bud on the tree blossoms. Some are quick to blossom. Some are slow. Some drop to the ground and make other trees, which then blossom in another you know, iteration, some of the bods fall to the ground and are eaten by animals that poop them out, that make other trees, but they all, you know, it, it all unfolds perfectly as it should, which is not to the mind is infuriating because the mind like always wants something to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and for, for the sort of the character that was here, it seems that, you know, these, so-called episodes of the, you know, the out-of-body experience, the the meditation, the self-inquiry um, caused this. It could, it could appear like that, but the risk of these sort of awakening stories is that the mind constantly wants to compare and contrast. Oh, I've not had that, so I'm not, yeah. I'm just not as far, I'm not as far ahead. Or I've had different things, maybe that's not real. And I got caught in this as well. You get, you go through, I don't know if you had this, but it's like this imposter syndrome. Like you, you catch yourself. The mind is like, you're just making this up. Like you're just pretending. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe I'm pretending because it's not, it's not all the time. It's not permanent, but you can't not be this. Like it, it, you, it doesn't matter. Like the, the most simple way I can put it is there is only all that there is. Right? We can call it whatever we want, but there is only all that there is, and that is what you are. If you have an unspiritual thought, you are still all that there is. If you believe you're enlightened, you are still all that there is. You know, everything is just all that there is. There's no separation. Uh, even the mind. So the mind's not necessarily a a bad thing. It's just, it's an aspect like the seaweed in the ocean or the shark in the ocean. It's just ocean, you know, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. that's it. You know, there, there's, mm. so yeah, it's, as I say, it's both 
depending on what you've seen and what you've realized, it's very comforting. And it's something you just relax into or it's infuriating because you feel, well, ah, there must be something I can do. Um, yeah. But you, you'll feel called to do stuff until you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And, until you don't, essentially. You don't need to do stuff anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful in that way. Oh, man. Yeah, I feel as though the last trap, if you want to call it that, the last attachment is the spiritual attachment, you know, the spiritual attainments or achievements that one needs to go through. I think they're honorable in that way, you know, they're noble attachments, <laughs> you know, it's better than other attachments I could see. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, it's just another attachment that does create separation because if this thing is all about... Um, Linking up with the one, the whole, the itness, the isness, and feeling that and seeing that, thinking that you are this spiritual person and being fake holy does create some sort of separation, as in like you're me, Gary, I'm important, I'm, right, I'm spiritual. Right. Well, no, we're all spiritual, we're all important, we're all holy by default. It's all perfect. So yeah, man, I can see that. And that's very tricky. I see that a lot in this, in this realm. You know, I, I see a lot of that in my algorithm, you know, some sort of <laughs> fake holiness. I'm not judging. I'm just saying I see it. I've been there also in previous years. But yeah, the greatest thing to know is that no matter what, all of this is spiritual, if you want to call it that. No matter what, even the shit, even the darkness is, is all perfect in that way. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's up to us to, I don't know if it's up to us. But yeah, I was going to say it's up to us to be able to see that. But really, is it? Is this like, would you say just like some kind of grace that comes in? You feel that in your life? Like it was just some sort of grace event that allowed you to be able to see this or are able to see this continually? Because, you know, let's be honest, man. Um, it's, it sounds arrogant to say, but not everybody sees this. Not everybody knows their God. And that pains me. But it's just the truth of the matter in the times that we're living in. Like, you know, not everybody knows their God and drag, as Ram Dass would say. And I can see it even though people don't see it. So was it, how do I put this? Was it something that we allowed in? Or was it something that we were just bestowed from some kind of greater force that we can't even fathom at this point? You know, is it up to us at all? I guess is what I'm getting at. Well, we we don't exist separate to to all that there is. So there isn't a, you know, we're back to the sort of conversation about the wave. Like, you know, does the wave owe, owe it to other waves to convince them that they're just the ocean? Well, either the wave understands it's not a wave and it, it understands it's just the ocean, or it's still kind of stuck in that sort of, separation do you know what i mean um because it's it's kind of perfect as it is like the the metaphor that that i try and use i'm tr always trying to think of visual metaphors because words are just they can't even get near it like you know the yeah. the moment you speak it's just it's a yeah. best <laughs> attempt you know yeah um but the the metaphor that I've come up with is, you know, the Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, with the prism mm -hmm. ex uh, experiment. So Newton in the 1700s, British scientist did this experiment where he shone a beam of light into a glass prism, and it slows down the, the waves of light into its different constituent forms and comes out as a rainbow. It also separates it into non-visible wavelengths which the eyes can't see like infrared and stuff but that was the first time that they understood some of what light was comprised of and i relate that to the light of awareness if we want to call it you know all that there is equals the light of awareness equals consciousness equals god equals spirit it's all the same thing but if we call it the light of awareness it's everywhere so when you you know Look in my room right now, look in your room. We can't point to a light. 
we can't say there's the light, right, in a physical sense, but we know there's light, but it's so dispersed, right? We don't see it in, in separately. So the body is kind of like a narrowing of this awareness. There's like this global awareness or globe, you know, universal consciousness, and it gets narrowed by the body into this narrow beam. Then that beam shines in the mind. That's the prism, right? This narrow beam of consciousness that's been narrowed in this body is then shone into the prism of the mind and the prism separates it. That's what the mind does, right? It separates and labels everything constantly. Good, bad, black, white, you know, tree, house, cloud, uh, whatever, right? Man, woman, name, you know, John, Dave, and so on. So it takes this universal consciousness, narrows through the body, the prism of the mind separates it out into the rainbow of experience and it kind of makes the world. It's not like the world doesn't exist. It's just not separate. It's made of the same light as this source. And without the prism, the light still is. And without the narrowing, the light still is. It isn't unaffected. Its quality has never changed. It's never, it wasn't made by the prism or made by the narrowing. It, it always is and always will be. And if it happens to get narrowed and put through a prism in this way, the, the rainbow comes out and it makes these individual things. But that's not an accurate description of, of what the light is. So that's the kind of metaphor, metaphor that I like to sort of use to try and explain this lack of any separation um, that there is the, literally like no no doer like nobody here you know there's like nobody home nobody home <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I guess um, yeah I feel that man um is what I was getting at is it's kind of grace to be able to see that, right? To get rid of the doer per se, to know that the doer is all an illusion. Um, but yet, I, it's just like I can't help but see it. Like I said, that we're not, we are all in that wavelength. Yes, we're literally on that wavelength of light that one light, but uh, this prism of the body is able to recognize that it is just a seeming prism within the one light. And I, it's like, why me? Even though you said there's no me, but like, why am I able to see that I don't exist? <laughs> why, you know what I mean? Why am I able to see through this seeming illusion? And, uh, and others not. And I know they're not others. It's all part of the one. There is seeming no separation. But like I said before, man, we don't we don't actually all see that. And it is perfectly imperfect in that way. But I don't know, man. Like uh, the differences and why I have this show is a difference in perspective. And having that different perspective on oneself or no self is a really big switch i feel in order to one find some semblance of peace in life in death and also in your life i feel as though comes about a different will in that um, i don't know some kind of universal will i'm not going to try to explain where it comes from or how or why there's no it, it just kind of flows differently right from that dichotomy we explained before less pursuits of materialism and more towards spiritualism. Um, so what I'm getting at is like, there's nothing that we could do to allow this at a, in an individual sense. Like there is meditation, there's modalities, but at the end of the day, if there is truly no doer here, um, how do I put this, man? It's hard because it's a paradox. It's simultaneously, I like explained before, there's nothing to do. 
but mm -hmm. there is something that you can do in order to realize there's nothing to do. Like there's, there's efforts and modalities and spiritual attachments that one could do. So I don't know what I'm getting at here, to be honest with you. It's like, what? Uh, I don't know. It's not up to us. Like, is it up to God per se to, to bring us all into the light and we'll get there eventually? Or is there something that we can do to, I guess, accelerate this process for, uh, for ourselves? Is it just, like you said, just let go of control? Is that really as simple as that? Just let go and there's a greater control that's all going on here? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems... I think I think I've heard it referred to as like the thorn. Have you heard about this thorn? Using a thorn to get rid of a thorn. So yeah. you have a thorn stuck in you, right? Which is the sep the belief in a separate self. And you can take that thorn out, but you actually need another thorn to kind of take it out. And that's the spirituality. That's what you're saying. And, and people get rid of the bigger thorn, like the uglier, horrible thorn of sort of you know physicality, separation, suffering but it's still a thorn they've used to get rid of it which is the attachment to sort of spiritual seeking and you know feeling that you know it's like it's what you said it, you know people do this and i think i probably did it as well you know you kind of think oh like i've got it now not, not like everything but I've, I've got it everything is one and they don't have it like it's, it's such a you know at the moment that you sort of say that you've l demonstrated that you've l you never had it or you've lost it anyway. Do you see what I mean? Cause you're saying everything's one and only I, you know, I know it and they don't, but if everything's one, there isn't, there aren't two. Do you know what I mean? So there's not a, there's nothing that's not known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it, I mean, another way is, you know, let's take a starfish, right? Starfish is on the beach and just, you know, one little, not the, the legs of it, but the, whatever you call them, the tiny little tentacles on the bottom of a starfish and little suckers, like one of those is touching the water, right? And the rest of it is out of the water. Those are like individuals or so-called individual people. Just because one is in the water, it might think, oh, I know what, I, I'm in the water. No one else is in the water. Nobody knows. But it's starfish, and the starfish knows it's in the water. Do you see? So it, it's kind of like, you know, what do all the other tentacles need to do to be in the water? They're in the water because they're starfish. Mm. Do, do you see what I mean? So th there's nothing that wet tentacle over here could do to impart about the wetness to the the tentacles that are still stuck on the beach other than say look i'm in it and you are this like we're guys we're in we're not tentacles we're starfish you are starfish i'm starfish yeah. we are wet you know what we're, we're already in this um so th these are kind of attempts to sort of try and get you know try to infer this sort of idea of letting go but they're never sufficient like the mind will you know any sort of question about why is always you know it's coming from the mind why why this why can't i do that or you know can we is there something that we can do and i say that the, the four paths are well the letting go one we've kind of discussed that a little bit there's one that i didn't mention that we went spoke about the outward one the inward one, we, we can talk about that uh, a bit more as well, the meditation song. But the fourth is just the direct path, which is like they call it the pathless path, which is just you are this. Deal with it. Like, you know, it, it's, it tries to just shortcut the whole thing and try and instill this realization right, right from the get-go. That's called the sort of the direct path. Um, But if, you know, if people are caught, you know, if they're, feel called to meditate or, or, you know, seek solace in, in God or in a, in a teacher or whatever, then they should do that because the, the end goal is ultimately the same, which is the dissolution of, of separation and, and the destruction of the separate self. Eventually it will happen. Some people, I mean, I've had guys contact me and they weren't in spirituality at all. Like there was a golfer contacted me a few weeks back 
And he's like, what is going on? I'm not, I've, I'm, I'm not a person and I don't know, you know, I've looked you up. I found you on you know, YouTube or whatever. what the hell's going on with me? Like he, he wasn't looking for this, you know, and there's plenty of stories of people like that, that, you know, step on a boss and suddenly boof, just gone, like no sense of self or anything. And yet others can seem to devote decades to it, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, who knows like you know who knows i mean somebody asked me i think just overnight they said you know why i think you know why why are we seeing or why you know why are you aware or something like that and i was like well i'm not party to the you know the original conversation it's like well why you know, why, why is there something called a smile? You know, what, why is the, this fish thing? Like, I mean, it, it's as a ludicrous a question. Like there's no reason ultimately for, for any of this. Um, it, it just is, you know, yeah. I, I think, you know, that of the four paths are so the outward, the inward, the letting go, and then the direct path for me, Personally, when I was going through this, the the inward path seemed to bear most fruit for me. But it's you know just like you know this all that there is has all these seemingly different forms, and it wakes up to itself in different ways in different prisms. You know, to take that metaphor again, different every prism is unique. You know, I mean, you can see that just from the spiritual landscape and what people have realized is ultimately the same thing but the way they talk of it and the way they teach it if they even do it all it is the to borrow the phrase is a wide spectrum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and, and this is really all talking about something that is unified so the the way that people might so-called wake up or the actions that they could take again is as varied as as that spectrum, you know, some do nothing, seemingly do nothing. Some spend decades, others believe, you know, they've taken lifetimes to achieve it or whatever. But ultimately, you, you're you already there. You know, you set off on this journey. This is what I felt like is set, setting off on the spiritual journey. You know, I've got a map, so I know where I'm going. No rough direction. There's, I'm looking for signposts. How far along am I? Am I getting close? Um, you know, I've got a compass for for direction, and I've I've got a name and an entity here, and that was how I started the journey. You know, and a and a bag of ideas on on my backpack, and then you're like, oh, you arrive where you set off. The person is gone the bag of ideas has been thrown away. There's no compass signpost or anything else. Like the, what starts the journey is not what ends um, the journey. So those, those different paths, inward, outward, uh, letting go in the direct path are all designed, if you like, or will all lead ultimately to the realization that there is nobody taking these paths. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man. How would you explain why that is like the good news? Because to somebody that has no idea, no, that doesn't know any better, that's listening to us two crazy guys here on the mic talk about <laughs> disintegrating the self. Um, why is that like happiness? Why is that this bliss and joy that we all yearn for, you know, getting rid of this idea of self and maybe reaching this uppercase S self, the knowing that we are a part of this grand mystery, this grand moment, always were and always will be. Why is that the good news? You know? Well, the easiest way to sort of describe this is with a, a story of something that happened to the so-called me um, through all of this. And I was watching my daughter at a swimming lesson, right? So I was in a swimming pool 
by the side, choosing the swim lesson, the teachers at the side, other parents sitting around. And I don't know what caused it. I don't know what happened, but just instantly I saw that everything was the same. Everything was made of the same stuff and everything had the same quality. So I looked, you know, at my daughter. I think it was probably because I was looking at my daughter, maybe sort of lovingly, oh, look at how she's doing. And then I looked at the water and I was like, huh, I feel exactly the same about that. And then I looked at the wall and I looked yeah. at the tile and it all had this, um, like a luminosity. I don't mean like a glare, like it wasn't like a vision or a hallucination or anything like that. It just had a very distant, friendly kind of light hum about it is the best way I can describe it. So before this, I would, you know, when you look at an object, you would get a sense of coldness. Like just say you're walking along a street and you see like a rock or whatever, you see a pebble or a little bit of litter or something like that. There's just a detachment there. Just like, oh, it, it doesn't even register. But after this, everything had what I can describe as an ambivalent benevolence. So I don't mean ambivalent as it, it couldn't care, but it was a a permanent like outpouring of friendliness and, and love, basically, from from in everything, from inanimate objects, even not like blissed out, but just a nothing could harm me in any way because it is me. Yeah, I see. Um. And I kind of very, I kind of was trying to verify it on on the drive home. So I was like looking at like houses driving past. I'm like, oh my god, they've got it as well. And this has not left me. This was years ago, and it's not. It wasn't a temporary experience. This was a. It literally like taking you know purple lenses off that you've had on all your life, and they just never go back on. Um, and I even got home, and you know, you mentioned the the shit earlier on. So I went out to mm. my back step where there's loads of bird crap i was even stu studying that i must have looked insane but i was looking at that and i was like <laughs> i was like dang like even that is so I, I i tell that story because to answer your question about why is the dissolution of the self the good news it's really because you there's nothing to worry about like anymore like how uh, do you know what i mean like yeah how could there be like you you know you go through life before thinking okay oh, i was born i'm this entity you're trying to you know build up this um this identity and this self you're trying to protect it at all times it's getting triggered left right and center you're trying to build it up you're constantly in this sense of lack and driving forward and at the back of back of all of it is, you know, two things: sense of lack and fear of death. Um, and when this is realised, both of those go away. So it's kind of that's good news, you know. Like it's very you know, good. News. You, I mean, initially it is terrifying. Initially, to the to the self that's been built up, it's horrible. It can be because you think you're losing something real yeah. and you think you think you're losing something that matters whereas ultimately you, you you're just unbecoming what you never were <laughs> but to yeah. the to the so-called separate self before that scene three you're like, like this is everything's going to fall apart like what am i going to do like and that's why i said going kind of jumping around a little bit but when when I was sort of incapacitated for a few months and I was like standing in the river of life like this, that was shortly after that experience where I, I couldn't process it. I didn't know it hadn't sort of embodied, if you know what I mean, I was still flip-flopping, still resisting essentially. I was, I was thinking I was surrendering by doing this and standing still and resisting everything, but I wasn't fully letting go. And because of that, because of that resistance, I was n neither going with the flow of like the spiritual side and, and what I'd actually known and experienced, 
nor was I re-engaging with, you know, the world and, and duties and, and stuff like that. So, um, and, and that was tricky. That was tricky. And that, that it, like all of it, it's just a time. It just takes time. Um, you know, but there came a point which is now established where it's basically like those inflatable characters, you know, on a motor forecourt thing. That's basically just what moves this. Like before there used to be an engine. This is what I was going to say. There used to be like an engine. I don't know if you felt this at any point in your life in your stomach, typically it's a not in your stomach, like a, a drive. Like it can be like a fear driven thing or a determination or a success or fight or flight, but it's like a, this, just like this engine. It, it, you yeah. can feel it, physically feel it in your stomach. Mm. And after this, it was just, uh, it was just gone. And it, it's, it was disorientating because you think, well, what, what's going to move me now? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, like I literally see that there's no, you know, I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I'm not afraid of anything. So what, motivates me to to move in the world and that but that was that transition between the full sort of realization of realizing there's no one here but still hanging on yeah what am i going to do how will i move because i'm still like you know the, the self was still like no don't let go mm -hmm. um but once that went it's i say it's just that that inflatable thing you know just and before you know it, you're out of bed. You, you've you've had a tea or a coffee, and you, you're just doing stuff. And it's just like it's like whack a mole at, at the arcade. You know, you just whatever pops up just gets dealt with. There's no like, oh, we must do this. Or, I want to do this because of such and such. Like the the two sort of drivers now are devotion. So devotion to this, the, the sort of the truth itself, and trying to communicate that and, and, you know, broadcast that as it were. And then the second driver um, is uh, not devotion. The second driver is, well, you have still have the desires, right? So there's still desires that come up, but it's not necessarily towards an external thing or, or a personal thing. It's more of a duty. So it's more, you know, you still, and this is, I did struggle with this for quite a while, but there's still a duty, like you come, you, so, so to speak, come back, but there's still a duty to look after, you know, the bag of bones, you know, yeah. and, and the family and the community. It's not that, you know, you see this and you go live in a hut and, you know, it, it makes everything more valuable. It makes everything even deeper when there's no you it's difficult to explain because you would think well surely there's you, you're not invested in it anymore but when you literally see yourself in everything you, how could you be more invested than that like you know it's yeah yeah well said wow yeah i think the greatest parts that you mentioned were that sense of invulnerability to everything and greatest of all, the sense of invulnerability and lack of fear of dying anymore. That's huge. That's in the back of all of our heads to know that truly, truly, this body may fade, but that isness will never fade. The essence that we see, the moment, the here and nowness. That transcends everything. Life, death, pleasure, pain. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful stuff, man. And the show does go on, that's for sure. The show goes on. <laughs> yeah. It's curious to me, though, is the show seems to... The show goes on, but it seems to change in how we play this character. It seems, at least. Like, you know, more toward loving more toward compassion and less competition, less trying to control the show, that's for sure. But there's just like a, when you flow with the show, there seems to just be a flowing toward natural love, 
I don't know how else to explain it, man. It may seem a little corny and cliche, but it's true. Just like naturally loving everything, which is just yourself. It's like you have to, like you said, there's the duty and obligation. Because why not? Why would you not love yourself? It's only going to cause suffering. And it just doesn't make any sense. At the end of the day, it seems to just not make sense. Do you feel that, like, you know, once you come back into the bag of bones, as you said, that there is this inclination toward compassion toward everybody in life? You know, is that how the show maybe differs? You know, we do before enlightenment per se, chop wood, carry water. And then after enlightenment, we chop wood, carry water, right? As the saying goes, but you yeah. feel as though there's a different essence in how we chop wood and carry water. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing everything through different eyes. You know, you're seeing through God's eyes or mm -hmm. whatever you choose to call it, spirit or all that there is, you know, you're, you're seeing, as everything rather than seeing as the individual so it can't help but influence how you move in the world and that that's the ongoing sort of unfolding mystery is how you take what you've realized and embody that in a human form and, and life um but yeah, it, to the outside looking in, it may not change that much at all. Um, you know, things still get done. Um, but the the way that you sort of interacting it is very very different. As you say, it comes from a different a different place because there's just a greater level of understanding of. You know, the fact that the being, you know, we all have the same being. Like, you know, you are being, the tree is being, I am being, but that being is is the same. You know, so that can't do anything other than, you know, influence. Well, it can't do anything other than be, but it, it can't do anything <laughs> other than influence how, how, you, how you interact with the world, you know. Yeah influence the becoming that right. never truly becomes it's a it's some kind of dance between being and becoming yeah and i guess what i was getting at is the becoming becomes so sweet it's a constant becoming that makes sense if we're making any sense here yeah it's uh beautiful and i feel as though uh sort of dreamlike you know the sort of dreamlike essence to life with a certain perspective and realization when, you know, that I imagine you sort of got when you're at your daughter's swim practice, sort of like everything is mystical. Everything is a miracle. And that is just truly unfathomable, like with to the rational mind, it's truly unconveyable. But to me, the word that comes up is dream, like very, not like we think of dreams as like not real i guess that's kind of what we're talking about here but it's even like realer than real if that makes sense it like it's the dream of all dreams yeah i don't know man I'm, my mind's just it's going off right now but you know what i mean it's it's uh it's sort of dreamlike in that and the dream never ends that's for sure i don't know well i think i think what you're getting at there is it, it's timelessness of it mm. i mean the mm. in in a sleeping dream there's no there's no sense of time yeah. really and there's not really the, the, everything is fluid in the in the sleeping dream right mm. the characters are fluid you know you one second you're here another second you're, you're in a different situation nothing's really that solid so I do relate to that because that is a is how it kind of seems that yeah. you know it's not that the world's it's not that it's not real it's that it's not what you thought it was so it's kind of like you know you've like flicked the screen 
you, you see the world on the screen and you know this awakening is kind of like you've pinged the screen and it goes boom 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 and you're like oh my god like it is there but it's just not what I thought it was. So yeah, I, I, I do see what, see what you mean about the, the sort of dreamlike nature of it. Yeah. yeah, I like how you described it. It's fluid and timeless because the dream does seem like that. It just morphs. There's no solidity per se. All of the solidity that we think is solid. It almost like a, it's like a dream moves faster, it seems. Or maybe slower. I don't know. There is no time. It's just like this... It's just this fluid motion. Things just morph and coming to being. Yeah, it, it seems to take on that essence. Because that is, I feel as though, the true essence. That is the true essence, man. It is, there is no time. There really is no solidity. So, in a way, yeah, it is definitely more dreamlike. Um, but still, that's not even doing it justice. No words do it justice, as we said, truly. Many different labels, many different narratives, many different names to that which is nameless. Um, but at the end of the day, man, you can never, you can never, you know, actually describe this so-called truth. You can try. We definitely tried for the past hour. I've tried in two hundred episodes of the podcast and had many other guests try to describe it. <laughs> it never, it never works, man. It never comes down to like, oh, yep, that's it. Ah, I mean, yeah, let me ask you this. Maybe this be like the last note that we leave off there. Like, why do we, you know, as the show goes on, like, what is the value in talking about it? You know, what is the value in having these conversations to you and maybe to others that aren't others? Like, what, why do we do this? Is this just for fun? Is it just entertainment at the end of the day? Or is there true value in, some guidance in this way. The story that I use for, for this question is the story of a bird, right? So there's a bird in the morning and it is gathering food, gathering sticks for its nest. And then it sings this beautiful morning song and you know, people wake up and you hear the bird song and then the bird one day, it feels different to the other birds. And this bird says, why am I doing all this? Like, why am I gathering this? And why am I singing? And why am I getting food? And then he thinks, oh, it's, it's for love. That's why I'm doing this, for love for my family, the love of the sound or to help others love the sound and so on. And then he thinks, actually, I'm not a bird because a bird is just a, a word that humans have given to me. I, I'm not separate to any of this. I am love. And even though it realizes that, the next morning it takes off and it sings the song. And as the song meets love, meets love with love everywhere it goes for no reason. For the sake of singing. <laughs> yeah. The song must be sung. <laughs> uh, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah. I don't have anything else to say, man, at that note. I don't have anything else to sing. <laughs> Perfect. But keep on singing, man. I uh, appreciate you. You're very well spoken. Um, appreciate you Thank coming you. on no, here. I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, do you have any last words? Or you just want to keep it at that. All good from this side. Right. Um, yeah. Keep on keeping on, Sonia. I appreciate you coming on here, sharing your time, effort, and wisdom. Um, that's it. Peace and love to you. Peace and love to anybody that listened this long. Let's keep on singing, y'all. Let's keep on singing. <laughs> All the best.